Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jared Lombard, a planner in the Community Development Group here at ARC, and I would like to welcome you to the ARC webinar series. We are coming to you live from all across the country this afternoon to talk to you about the recently completed Chattahoochee Riverlands plan. The Chattahoochee River is one of the region's great nat natural treasures, but access in many areas is limited. In this webinar today, we will hear from regional and national experts about this new plan to create a more than 100 mile network of trails and parks along the river that connects communities and provides new places to walk and bike while preserving this vital natural resource. For those of you who have joined us on previous webinars, this may be a repeat, but we want to make sure that you have an enjoyable experience. So before we start, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You are listening using your computer speaker systems by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone or are having audio difficulty, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions in the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A at the end of today's presentation. You'll also see chat messages from us in that window. If you are multitasking and click out of the webinar and lose uh, the image or the control panel, click the flower icon that's illustrated in the center of the screen uh, in the taskbar in your computer. This should bring you back to us in the webinar. So let's get, get on with the show. We have three great speakers today. My colleague, Byron Rushing from ARC, Gina from SCAPE, and Walt from the Trust for Public Land. Also with us today is Paul Donsky from ARC, who's gonna moderate the questions. I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Byron, who will get us started. Great, thank you, Jared. And thank you to all of our attendees. I will be pulling up um, our PowerPoint for the day while, we are, while I'm chatting. Um, so good afternoon to everybody. Um, and Jared, I'm not gonna go through check-in audio and video. I'm assuming you'll flag me if you can't hear me properly. Um, so with that, uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, this is a uh, webinar presentation on the Chattahoochee Riverlands, a project and plan that ARC uh, recently finished all the technical work for. Um, it is still technically draft until our board votes on it uh tomorrow afternoon so we're very excited to have the plan wrapping up um, and have all the great feedback which we'll go through uh during the process um i am going to give a review of the study and talk through some of the details um for how we approached this enormous question of building um or envisioning a greenway along the chattahoochee river throughout the entire atlanta metropolitan area um and then i'm going to meet myself and turn the rest of the presentation over to gina worth with scape landscape architects our technical um, lead consultant to talk through about how the project team approached this enormous question, uh, both defining some of the goals that we were trying to achieve as well as achieve those goals in the preferred alignment and the visioning that we did. Um, and then finally, the last presenter will be Walt Ray with the Trust for Public Land. Uh, TPL really brought on some conservation and um, historical thought leadership from the metro Atlanta area they've worked for 30 years on preserving the Chattahoochee River um, and we we're very excited to have them as partners along with the city of Atlanta and Cobb County as two of our local funding partners um, and then recently at the very end of the project Gwinnett County came on board um, to help get us over the finish line so thank you to our three local partners for uh, participating and really giving us uh, some great insight into their study areas um, so with that uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we envision this project um did i lose my slides it's there. um so the 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 question that we started out with was the chattahoochee river has been an enormous natural 
um, and community resource for the metropolitan Atlanta area for um, for decades. Um, and we really looked at some of the things that were occurring, uh, Trust Republic Land, Cobb County, and then the city of Atlanta and ARC all kind of came into this conversation at various times to say each of us have worked along the Chattahoochee River and many things have led us to be able to start to envision a connected regional trail that traces um, the general waterway of, of the Chattahoochee River basin. Uh, partly that is a question about local governments who have really done a lot of work to start to build small pieces of this. And I was really excited that as we started to approach this question, um, it moved from how do we build a um, regional trail to start to how do we connect a lot of in progress and small local trails into this bigger regional um, corridor. So that was really exciting to see all the stuff that was going on. And then the other big element too was that um, the water quality has really improved thanks to groups like the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper um, and the city of Atlanta and other organizations who came in to really talk about the historic uh, water quality challenges along the river. And the water quality has improved to the point where we can start to talk about um, new opportunities to access the river. So all these pieces were floating around and um, the funding partners and the design team came together in 2018 to say, let's spend um, 18 months and it stretched on to 20 months, um, just shy of two years to say, how do we craft this big vision? And this is a nice overview slide of what that looks like starting um, near Lake Lanier and Beaufort Dam in Forsyth and Gwinnett counties, uh, so the very northern end of the metropolitan region, um, and then tracing um, 100 river miles and what has become about 125 trail miles down to Chattahoochee Bend State Park in Coweta and Carroll counties. So this is a tremendous amount of ground to cover. Um, as I mentioned, we spent about 18 months on the vision work. And as part of that, we had lots of conversations with stakeholders who we'll talk about variously throughout the process um, and have come up with several things. One is this orange route that you'll see um, on various maps that Gina is gonna talk about, as well as some other little small um, side routes that we really think of as tributary trails that connect out to local communities or small um, alternate trails that gave us um, some different staging opportunities as implementation moves forward. But this is really what the regional trail looks like um, at the 30,000 foot view above the metropolitan region. Um, and I've mentioned several times, uh, we it went into this envisioning it to be a green way. So a multi-use path, um, much like many of the trails that we have in the metropolitan region, uh, typically 10 to 14 feet of concrete hard surface. Uh, we looked at some impervious and pervious soft surface alternatives as well too, but really things like the Silver Comet Trail, the Big Creek Greenway, uh, the Roswell River Trails, or even the Beltline, which is a much different kind of area, but the same type of trail that would be a hard surface accessible to the widest variety of people um, in the region. So we envision that as being the Greenway with all these little destinations and access points, um, both existing and planned along the river. But as we got into this conversation and started talking to groups um, like the National Park Service and lots of recreational groups who have really done a lot to promote paddling on the river, uh, we started to integrate um, a blue way element to it. So the river itself being a recreational leisure paddling opportunity that would hopefully come out and tie in um, at access points that, that coincide with the trail um, to add this, this paddling um, and leisure element to it. And then as I mentioned, uh, there are so many great trails in the metropolitan Atlanta region. Um, I meant, named several, several of them. I'll get into trouble if I don't name all of them, so I won't uh, even try to, but lots of these great trails that are coming into the river um, from nearby communities or even across the, uh, the entire region or other states. Um, and we really said, you know, the, the Chattahoochee River forms such a core spine throughout the metropolitan region that these connections are really um, what will feed into that network and make this doable. So we call those tributary trails. Um, some of them follow actual river tributaries and some of them follow other types of uh, linear corridors like roads or um, existing trail corridors. And there's a lot of cities that we nickname trail towns or, or river towns um, along that area that we've, re we've seen, we've heard from local governments about how these have started to build up um, as having recreation as part of the core focus of their local economies and development strategies. So these three elements together are what combine to we call the river lands, the river in the land, uh, the trail network that traces along the Chattahoochee River. Um, we had four project goals that define the Riverlands. I'll defer to Gina and let her talk about that um, in just a moment, but it really is about safety connectivity um, for people as well as creating an ecological refuge and building on the natural resources um, that the Chattahoochee River provides the entire region. 
So here's a brief overview of the study. As I mentioned, we had four funding partners uh, at the beginning, two regional partners, us at the Atlanta Regional Commission, as well as the Trust for Public Land, and then two local partners, Cobb County and the City of Atlanta, along with Gwinnett County, who joined us um, at the end of the project to, to get some of the Gwinnett County pieces um, where they wanted them to be. So thank you to all of our funding partners. This was a tremendously smart team um, and dedicated team to work with. And I think we have several of our local funding partners on the call today. So thank you to everyone who's been able to attend, as well as the elected officials who uh, from these organizations who really helped us get to where we wanted to be. Um, and then we had a design team, and this is really um, like going back to college for me because we had such a smart group of folks that we we're working with. Um, Scape Landscape Architects, um, Gina Worth is, is with them, and I'll let her maybe tell a little bit about her company um, when we get there. But if you have heard about Scape in the past few years, um, their founding partner, Kate Orff, won a MacArthur Genius Award for some um, natural restoration work that they've done in New York um, in New York City over the past several years about embedding oysters into the um, riverways to create different storm barriers and filtration systems. So a really, really smart group of folks um, who are growing their national presence, and we were excited to work with them uh, here in the Atlanta area. Um, our local partnerships were really represented by um, Gresham Smith and Erin Thornson um, and her great project management uh, that she lent us to bring um, a local Atlanta office perspective to it. Gresham Smith has worked on trail projects around the region, and we were excited to have their expertise, as well as Biohabitats, New South Associates, uh, Drs. Nataki Osborne Jelks and Dr. Richard Milligan, um, both Georgia State professors who brought a lot of um, academic backbone to the project, and Edwards Pittman who helped us with some specific study work. So, very, very smart team, um, and we were excited to have uh, the scope of work to really let some of these folks turn loose and answer some of these really challenging and difficult questions and come out with such a great product. Um, and I think the major thanks goes to the organizations uh, who represented um, their jurisdictions or uh, nonprofit organizations on our Chattahoochee Working Group. This is a group that's been convened by the Trust for Public Land for several years now, and we were excited to borrow their expertise um, to use that for um, helping us understand the challenges and the opportunities along the river. I won't read this list, um, but if you're with a local organization and you don't see yourself represented here, please always reach out to myself or Walt Ray um, to join them. Um, and then finally, this is a 100 mile area that we could not um, take in one go. So we broke it down into three sub area sections um, and we had similar types of groups uh, from the local neighborhood associations um, on up to county level groups who uh, met us in their local area and walked us through different parts of the river. Um, and if you see yourself on this, thank you for attending and joining us. Um, we won't be recommending these uh, for a little while, but it was really, really fun to be walking along the river with a lot of these great folks. Um, and then finally, the study schedule, the really the core piece of it, as I mentioned, we started in December 2018 um, and wrapped up the technical work in May of 2020. Our official board adoption um, is hopefully uh, tomorrow. Um, so we will be ending this officially as a study in August of 2020, uh, but that's really the start of day one for implementation and building this out to be. Um, a bigger project over time. If you look through the final report, we'll give you a snapshot of it at the very end, uh, but if you see items that are outlined in this teal or cyan color, um, those are really moments of public engagement and hopefully you were able to join us for some of those. Uh, we had traditional public meetings as well as uh, what we called river rambles, walking up and down the river um, and bringing folks out to the river to learn, explore, and give us uh, their interpretation of the river experience. Um, and then uh, lots of other sub area groups, as, as I've mentioned. If you see an element that's outlined in brown, those are what we call river stories, uh, stories of historic or personal interest, things that we heard from the public, um, great stories that we read about historically, um, or elements that we really wanted to bring up and feature and, and keep um, in front of the river story as an as a important element for understanding the river and interpreting the river moving forward. And then lots of the stuff and the pieces that Gina's going to walk through in just a moment um, are outlined in a kind of a dark green color. They're the really technical elements. As a planner, I love that stuff. Um, it does get kind of dense, so we've tried to break it up with lots of different stories throughout the final report, which again will give you a snapshot at the very end. Um, I'm going to look briefly at the research and really talk about how we interpreted the, re the river's story over time. Um, we started as far back as we could, um, uh, prehistoric and pre-colonial eras, really looking at the river as a way of life and understanding um, how the Chattahoochee River has formed such an important boundary 
between um, nations and states throughout uh, our region's history and really provided opportunities for people to both uh, connect as well as uh, take advantage of those natural resources. And we looked way, way down into the archaeological record to find some of those stories and bring them up and feature them uh, in the work that we continue to do. Um, we looked at the river as a driver of industry and a lot of the mill ruins and um, early industrial sites that still live along the river. Uh, the river is a barrier to movement. We've heard from a lot of folks that uh, the only place, the only times they see the river is when they're on one of those bridges over the top of it. And we understand that even today, um, the importance of bridges crossing the river has really defines how people can move along the river. And then uh, the river is a regional utility. Uh, today, the river provides a lot of um, uh, modern industrial services to us in terms of generating uh, power as well as retaining uh, drinking water. And that really comes out of um, the past century of uh, using the river and building along it, which is important to take into consideration. Um, and then some of the stories that we heard across the river were um, the the post-industrial era of the river, when it kind of fell into disregard, uh, the fast expanding metropolitan region uh, really jumped, leapfrogged over the river and it became the back door for a lot of communities. Um, and the legacy of that is needing conservation and attention was really reflected starting in the 60s and 70s with the Friends of the River organization um, that spearheaded a lot of the conservation movements and resulted in the national parks units that we enjoy today, as well as a lot of planners and people who used to uh, fill my seat before I got here, who really said, how can we uh, start to address some of these challenges of growth um, and impact along the river? So we inherited this enormous legacy um, from folks. We were excited to talk to many of those people and learn um, the work that they did that really resulted in today um, this opportunity to reconnect with the river and bring people back to the river. Um, it's such a beautiful natural area in the midst of a major metropolitan area. It really offers us a lot of opportunities um, and we are very cognizant of that. If you're interested in the stories that we started to try to tell in this, I encourage you to, to go find the, the report. Uh, we'll, we'll give you the link to it at the very end of this. Uh, but we really wanted to talk about these cultural and historic resources, uh, these different elements that exist from that historical story um, that are still accessible or maybe not accessible that we would like to start to uncover and bring forward. So we found those stories up and down the river, and that was a really exciting part of the conversation. Uh, as I mentioned, we want to maintain the river's ecological uh, resources. Uh, the river is such a small watershed that both provides drinking water to millions of residents as well as natural habitat um, that's uh, lost and being lost in the metropolitan region. So we really looked at the river as an opportunity to provide ecological resources and say, how do we not just bring people to the river, but bring people to a river um, in a in a light touched way and possibly even a restorative way um, to uncover some of those backdoor areas and, and re-enlighten them. Um, and then a river for all, um, one of the things we heard in particular around trails and all sorts of new development in the region is the threat that that poses to communities. There's very many historic communities along the river um, who may not have the political or capital resources to dictate their future when infrastructure arrives. And so we wanted to talk about where are those areas and what are the strategies that we as a planning, planning team can use um, to offset some of those. So we really looked at equity and these conversations about who has access to the river and who should have access to the river um, in different parts of the region. Um, and then finally, the, the, the planner side, looking at the public infrastructure um, for roads and bridges, as well as access to public transit um, and access points into the river, including um, boat docks and other places that people have to physically get down into the river these days. Um, and so that's really embedded throughout is to say, where is access currently and where access could be um, over time? So you'll see that reoccurring uh, is how do we increase access? Um, and then I must mention uh, one of ARC's core roles as a regional entity is to uh, shepherd the Metropolitan River Protection Act and bring forward those uh, regulatory frameworks that were established in the 70s and 80s um, to help protect the river and do that uh, in a way that leaves disturbed and undisturbed buffers largely intact uh, to serve their natural purpose. So we are excited to work with Jim Santo in our office um, and lots of other great partners who helped us understand how development occurs near the river and how that we can do that safely, effectively, um, and maintaining some of that ecological barrier um, and function. So we are excited to work with the um, MRPA or Metropolitan River Protection Act and we'll continue to work with their staff to understand how to do this effectively. Um, so the end of my presentation um, is given all that research, given all that uh, deep dive that we spent about a year working on, 
Um, if you're excited in this, please go pick up uh, the, re the piece of the report that gets into this in great detail. But we really came away with a major conclusion that there's three distinct areas along the river. Um, there is the urban core, uh, the city of Atlanta and, and our neighbors across the river in Cobb County with lots of industrial land that kind of anchors that middle portion. Um, there's a lot of disturbed land that runs right up to the edge of the river as well as a lot of jobs and a lot of the real uh, core economic functions that occur in the region. Um, and those are elements that we really wanted to work with. To the north of that, um, what we nicknamed the suburban parklands or sub area one, being the largely residential areas with a lot of the national parks and, and county and city parks units um, that are so beautiful. And it's what a lot of us think of when we think of going to the Chattahoochee River, uh, the Palisades or other areas. Um, and so that was a great area to really work with the historic investment that's been done. And then the, the Southern, the agricultural countryside, sub area three, being this area that has some working farms, some very large properties um, and a lot less disturbance that we don't want to encourage new disturbance, but we want to start to uh, capture some of the great uh, spirit that's down there. Um, so these different areas uh, each require different solutions. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Gina Worth with SCAPE um, to talk through how their uh, firm and their partners approached many of these questions. And Gina, you can start talking. I'm going to take just a second to hand you control of Perfect. the slides. Well, thanks, Byron. Um, and, you know, thanks really to all for inviting Skate to be part of the conversation today. Uh, working along this 100-mile corridor is by far the largest scale project in our office. Um, it's a extraordinary site and study area uh, with extraordinary people and the resources of the river um, I think compared to none in terms of their potential to uh, kind of improve connectivity and improve the ecological and social health of the Atlanta metro area. Um, Byron, are the controls passed over? They should be. Let's see. And if they're not, I'm happy to advance them for you. It looks like they are. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, so today, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about uh, the overall project goals that were collaboratively developed, both with the client team um, that's here on the phone today, but also with the wider public. Uh, we see every piece of the process uh, was a public engagement and collaborative effort. And so even setting up the project goals that would shape the alignment of the riverlands and determine pilot sites and demonstration projects, those were all part of a piece of public discourse. Um, I'll then also speak a little bit about some of the design strategies that we use to work at this enormous scale of 100 miles um, and think both in a granular way and the big picture way about the Riverlands itself. Okay, so one of our first goals, and I think this was a very important goal for many users of the area, particularly bicyclists and pedestrians, that the Riverlands be a safe and connective corridor. Um, we know that uh, traffic safety is a, a primary concern in the metro Atlanta region, um, that the Riverlands is an opportunity to provide alternative ways of navigating, uh, both from a recreational perspective and a commuting perspective, navigating the region in ways that do not require a car. Um, and so for Atlanta, this could be potentially quite transformative. And so creating the Riverlands as a safe and connective corridor um, kind of really sets up that goal. Some of the sub pieces of this goal are shown here in this drawing. So um, if you remember, Byron introduced the three different kind of distinct sub areas uh, that the, the project was uh, broken up into. There's quite a lot of diversity within each zone. So it's not a you know, perfect one-to-one -one all the time, but the agricultural countryside, sub area three is shown on the left of this drawing. The urban core and the kind of industrial areas close to Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, are um, in the middle. And then the uh, pieces on the right uh, are the northern sub area, sub area one, the suburban parklands where those um, CRNRA sites are so densely concentrated and so beautiful. And so this is more of a conceptual mapping showing how the riverlands could move through these different areas and uh, be connected in these different ways while embracing these kind of sub principles of these goals. So one of the thoughts here was to um, design a multimodal trail, a trail that could accommodate both bicyclists and pedestrians and users of many different abilities. Um, that the trail itself was not purely a, a network for commuting or recreation, but that it was about creating a continuous public realm that stitched together different sides of the river 
and that brought the river more fully into the public realm, that the safe connected corridor would extend to the water, that would be able to increase water access directly with people and have points where people could bring their own boats or rent boats and bring them onto the waterway, um, that this project could also tie back and connect into public transportation. Uh, so mapping out the many MARTA stations as well as other bus stops uh, within the area and making sure that the Riverlands had potential to connect to some of those stations or tributary trails that fed the Riverlands could connect into those stations. Um, planning for accessibility, I already uh, referenced that this was a very primary goal of the project, that the Riverlands needed to be accessible to people of all ages and all walks of life, um, and that this project overall would promote health and safety on land and on water creating safe crossings and where the Riverlands intersects major uh, vehicular infrastructure, that those crossings were signaled and, and uh, kind of crafted and designed in a way that enabled safety. So these were all things that we heard from different individuals within the project team and the working group team that helped drive the alignment of Riverlands. Um, so here you see the kind of the result of some of that work. Um, this is the preferred alignment that Byron mentioned, um, laid out uh, in this bird's eye perspective. So we're looking uh, in the foreground is the southern piece of the study area, the Chattahoochee Bend State Park at the bottom right. Um, and the top left is the northern piece of the study area at Buford Dam and Lake Lanier with Atlanta directly in the middle. Um, and I do love this project because I think one of the, the um, I love this image because one of the things this image speaks to is just the, the scale of this proposal. I think Atlanta um, has been so defined by its radial highway network that surrounds it, busway network um, and the interstates, and that this new infrastructure of the Riverlands, this pedestrian and bicycle network, kind of is at that same scale and has the potential to transform Atlanta in a new century um, in a way that the highways transformed Atlanta in the last century. Our next goal um, also came very directly from community feedback that the trail and this linear public realm must be a common ground for all, uh, that it creates inviting destinations to a wide variety and diversity of users and feeds and um, diversifies the programs and types of spaces available to all communities that lie along and within the boundary of the river. So some of the kind of direct goals shown here um, are that the the trail, in addition to being a linear piece of connectivity infrastructure, the trail could identify sites for remediation and restoration. There's many communities within the watershed and directly adjacent to the river um, that have suffered from contamination and pollution, that the introduction of the trail could also go beyond pure transportation and think really about environmental remediation and um, the social infrastructure within this area that the trail uh, and its alignment could identify opportunities for economic development to help improve the uh, economy and tax base of these small communities, sometimes small, sometimes large communities lining the river, um, that the trail could connect all communities to public space. Uh, some areas today technically have access to the river but don't have a large public realm or a large place for people to go and sit and linger and socialize along the river. With COVID, we understand that these needs are very important and that even small areas of public um, gathering space and open areas that are well ventilated are invaluable and need to be very equitably distributed around different communities. Um, and that these spaces should feel very inviting, uh, inviting to all types of people and respond very directly to the communities surrounding them. So there was always a goal to work very directly with community members, um, both at this kind of big vision that we've been working on in the past couple of years but also as this project carries forward to continue those conversations and make sure that the programs and types of activities proposed are aligning with real community needs. And so you see some of those aspirations kind of hitting the ground in the vision here and this perspective, that the trail is truly a common ground for all, um, that it really embraces some of the existing and unique qualities of um, the site. Uh, and so here's a space where a public space with public art inspired by community work um, is being proposed below one of these interstate overpasses. Um, you see the multimodal uh, trail in the foreground with bike, bicyclist, uh, bi-directional, and a pedestrian space. 
uh, destination and wayfinding space that really helps connect people to this, the, the assets and the communities around them to orient themselves within the project. Um, and then features like educational signage and braille trails. Uh, we had a really great, um, what we called an accessibility river ramble, uh, a, a group of um, different members of the um, community uh, of visually impaired people and disabled people or people with disabilities came together. And we had an event along the Riverlands um, at one of the CRN or A units, trying to understand how people with disabilities used trails and what types of wayfinding cues and pathway surfacing techniques um, and lingering pullover spaces were really needed to serve uh, a wide population of people. And so one of those thoughts that came out of that was a braille trail, a space uh, where visually impaired users could also use the trail like everyone else. Our uh, third goal, very important goal, um, is thinking about both the Chattahoochee Riverbed itself, but also the greater watershed. Um, and remembering that the Chattahoochee today is an ecological refuge for the region and that this function really needs to be preserved for long term. Um, and that the introduction of the Riverlands Trail uh, cannot dilute or deteriorate the environmental quality of the surrounding area and that we must balance conservation and access. Um, and so this goal translated into um, wherever possible promoting tributary health. This is something that we see um, in the um, pilot site proposal, we can speak more to this. How can we use the opportunity of constructing a trail to also do restoration of some of the smaller tributaries that feed the Chattahoochee? How can we use the project to enhance ecological connectivity? For example, could we expand grassland areas or reforest some of the um, deforested banks of the Chattahoochee and help improve ecological connectivity within the system? Um, how do we align with MRPA, uh, the Metropolitan River Protection Act that Byron mentioned, uh, confirming and upholding the strong values that have protected this portion of the river cor corridor for so long? Um, and how can we also balance conservation and access, uh, making sure that there are places for people to um, not only protect these ecosystems, but see, understand, and interpret them, because it's difficult for people to protect ecosystems that they can't experience. And so this image here is a kind of cross-section view showing uh, the ecological refuge for the region goal. Um, we looked quite a lot at the different, uh, kind of very interesting kind of cosmopolitan array of fish species by both um, warm water fisheries and cold water fisheries coming from the dam area um, that use the river and the kind of interesting intersections between them. Um, and also thinking about the trail and the wider uh, kind of habitat around it as very much part of this riverlands network. And that feeds into our final goal for the project, um, understanding that this project is a very long-term effort uh, and it needs to be a living legacy for future generations, uh, that it can reveal and connect historic resources uh, within the project, but also will be built over um, a number of years or a number of decades, uh, and it needs to be flexible enough to adapt to all of these different changing conditions. And so some of the principles um, expressed within this goal uh, are really about um, orienting and educating through signage and wayfinding, making sure there's this consistent network of wayfinding and, and signage elements that help you understand um, the legacy of the river and the many advocates uh, that have worked to preserve it in the past. Uh, thinking about anticipating growth and fostering equitable development, tying back into that goal of common ground for all, that this will unfold over a series of years or decades, and that along with infrastructure planning, we should also be thinking about the preservation of affordable housing and equal access uh, to live and enjoy and recreate in these areas. Um, and that along with the evolution of this project, our climate will be changing around this work. And so interpreting and designing uh, to interpret landscape change will be a very important piece um, of this project. Um, finally, revealing and connecting historic resources along the river, um, some which are known, some which are uh, yet to be excavated, but locations are anticipated, uh, was a big piece of the planning effort and work. In a lot of cases, we were trying to connect people to existing historic sites that were, were of archaeological interest, but in some cases, we're actually trying to have the trail avoid some of those sites so they're not disturbed or damaged by um, public access. And so here you see some of the interpretive elements. It's like living educational legacy of the project proposed, 
a wetland get down that helps children and families interpret wetland ecosystems, um, additional educational signage, um, and gathering spaces that can act like outdoor classrooms that enable stewardship and education around the ecological resources of the river. So uh, the plan, the plan for this project, uh, as, as Byron mentioned, we did just, I would say like an epic amount of community outreach and engagement throughout this effort. Um, but we also had a number of other uh, more plannerly tools that we used to help help us make decisions around uh, different proposals for the trail. So one of the big moments in the project was after we had gathered all the community feedback about the different goals, after we had gone through a number of sub area committee and Chattahoochee working group sessions about um, the existing conditions of each site and each area, uh, we used this whole set of different layers of maps and of information uh, to help determine different alignments, different possible alignments for the main Riverlands Trail and the network of tributary trails and the Blue Way Network, these points of new water access. And so you can just see some of these tools here on the screen. Uh, one is just our base map that include an aerial showing the patterns of urban development. Um, we use this tool to help understand what areas were publicly owned versus areas that are privately owned because there are many pieces of the Chattahoochee um, that are uh, privately owned along the edge. And so that could make a trail alignment much more difficult. Um, we looked at different slope analysis techniques, understanding how steep and how shallow some of the slopes were. Um, we would not want to be in any type of steep slope that would be difficult to build or ecologically negative or kind of erosion inducing to build on. Um, we also don't want to be in areas that are too shallowly sloped and part of that critical floodplain of the river, um, because that would be an uh, ecologically damaging thing to do. And so some of this information got layered up into uh, suitability analyses, both for ecology and connectivity, um, that Biohabitats, one of our kind of partners on the project, really helped assemble, um, trying to layer up all these different systems, look at them, both in isolation, but also in combination um, and, and provide some cues on where are zones that ha would have the least ecological impact or might connect the best to adjacent communities. So we use these tools. We also use a whole bunch of other um, sets of maps and information like the ones that Byron had shown in the beginning of the presentation, looking at the archeological sites, looking at the zones of um, intact forest cover to make sure we weren't Slicing and dicing up critical ecological resources. Um, and through this big like interactive work session where we spread all the maps out on the floor of the Atlanta City Studio, uh, we developed a couple of different alignments for review by the greater community. Um, we did some of this in our office, we did some of this in the city, uh, and we this, this alignment process is incredibly iterative and informed by a number of rounds of community feedback. Um, we, we landed on three alignments, three different 100 mile or 100 mile plus alignments for the trail. Um, the first on the left was the path of least resistance. So this was trying to understand, um, you know, how could we align the trail to just be as easy as possible to implement. So the most public ownership, the easiest pathways, the simplest slopes, where could the trail go? A second uh, alternative was a path of least ecological impact. And so this was trying very hard to avoid any areas where the trail could potentially have a negative impact on the ecosystem. So avoiding any wetland areas, pulling the trail back from the river's edge in a lot of cases to, uh, to not have it be too close. Um, and so in a lot of places, aligning along existing roadways. And the third option was looking at this network of destinations. This one was like, the planner's dream? What if you could connect all the great places along the river to one another and end up with this kind of web system of trails? Uh, the network of destinations probably doubled the actual linear feet of the, the Riverlands Trail, so it's maybe a more ambitious effort. But by looking at these three different options, um, we were able to kind of understand different decisions. Like, So for example, if when you took the path of least ecological impact, um, it was very positive from an ecological perspective, but often you weren't very close to the river and didn't really have a great sense of that river resource. Um, when you looked at the network of destinations, there was this great web of connectivity, but it was probably you know, doubling or tripling the, the uh, ambition of the project, the overall project costs, 
and the timeline for implementation. Um, and the path of least resistance was also um, very straightforward, very functional. And in many cases, we used this path when it aligned with all the other goals of the project. But sometimes it lacked a little bit of that like magic of um, and missed, missed some opportunities in connecting amazing resources along the river. So the preferred alignment uh, that really came out of a hybridization of all of those three different uh, kind of test alignments. And this preferred alignment now serves as the framework for aligning both the Greenway, the Blueway, and the tributary trails. It's the seamless network of public spaces and access points along the river. It's shown here in the orange. Um, we did want to make sure that we weren't simply proposing one alignment for the project, because uh, as you can imagine, for a project that needs to unfold over, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, um, probably things are going to change, probably parcels will change hands, probably conditions will change. We needed some level of flexibility embedded in the proposal, so we developed a practical alternative. Um, and so this is a proposed route for the trail. Um, that is the alternative when the preferred alignment might be infeasible, um, where someone decides they don't want to sell a piece of private property, or they don't want to grant access to a river's edge, or the ability to construct along a highway is a lot more complicated than we thought um, in this early level of planning. And so the practical alternative might be easier to implement in some areas. It might be a little bit less enjoyable experientially because it's often following utility corridors and existing right of ways. Um, that aren't always up close to some of those amazing magical moments along the river, but it does take advantage of existing trail infrastructure, easements, and publicly owned land. And so we think this is a very practical and useful alternative to have as a kind of back pocket scenario. Um, and then we have one other alternative, which is maybe a more aspirational alternative. Uh, it offers a better trail experience for the users. It's closer to the river's edge but definitely more challenging and likely more costly to implement. Um, so it's aspirational in that nature, but we do think there are communities out there that have expressed interest in being very aspirational with this project and may kind of latch on to certain elements of this alignment to advance uh, kind of given um, different areas, uh, kind of regional priorities. And so this also just felt very important to document for future consideration because we gathered so much great stakeholder feedback. We didn't just simply want to throw that out, we wanted to formalize that and capture that with the project. So this might be a longer term option or phase of the Riverlands project. Um, and then finally, the tributary trails, incredibly important network of trails, uh, because one thing we learned with this big project effort is that while there are towns and cities close to the river, most population centers are a little bit removed from the river itself. And so these tributary trails are very important connectors that link the river to population centers. Um, many follow the tributaries that actually feed the river and speak to the quality of that larger watershed, but sometimes they, um, a tributary trail can be proposed without a um, actual water tributary in place. And what's exciting about this is that many tributary trails are already in place. Um, some are existing, some are in the process of being planned, like the Proctor Creek Greenway, which is partially constructed and partially planned. Um, and so there's just this huge potential to tie into this energy behind all these other advancing projects. These tributary trails um, provide connection between local destinations um, and the riverlands, and they create this cohesive network uh, of, or integrated system of trails. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to very briefly almost like whiz by or fly by um, all of the different uh, what we call the planning and alignment tiles of the project. So this is facing the riverlands from the uh, north uh, at Lake Lanier all the way to the south, uh, Chattahoochee Bend State Park. Each one of these little squares represents the format of the screen. Can I show you my hands? Um, that you'll see in the next uh, following pages. So this information is all publicly available. And if you're interested in where the Riverlands is proposed within a segment um, that might be close to your house or close to your school or close to a park that you love, you can look up all these different tiles um, on our project website and see them in more depth. So starting from the north and working south, yeah, here we are at Buford Dam. Um, you can see here that one of our major um, moments or trailhead moments, uh, the kind of northernmost trailhead moment 
is at uh, Sugar Hill. And so this is a demonstration site that I'll be speaking to a little bit later in the presentation. You can interpret these maps. I'll just move to the next one. We're moving south. You can interpret these maps um, by understanding that the main the stem or main trail of the Riverlands Trail is this proposed line in orange here. Sometimes this line um, overlays with an existing trail. Sometimes it's a brand new proposal for a trail, but this would be the main path of the Riverlands, that multi-use bicycle and pedestrian network. Um, the practical alternative uh, is the line shown in teal and the uh, other alternative, the more aspirational alternative um, is shown in brown. I think we don't have an aspirational alternative on this particular page, but I'll point it out on the following page. Um, you can also see some of our proposals for water access. Some exist, um, shown here in the little blue icons, and proposed existing and proposed are shown as kind of inverted color uh, colors. So they're shown as these little icons with paddlers and canoers and floaters along the waterway. Um, Moving, moving south, so we're again, we're kind of moving south through the system. You can see how the preferred alignment of the trail wraps different sides of the river. Um, sometimes it actually crosses the river at existing and proposed bridges, and sometimes it wraps both sides of the river, providing access to communities and park resources on either edge. So in this zone, we're really moving through some of the um, uh, Chattahoochee uh, River National Recreation Area sites and beginning to kind of link them to one another, creating this network of uh, trails and public spaces that follow the river and connect existing park resources. Um, here we are looking from Collie Creek to Abbott's Bridge, moving even further south. So this was that little segment where the preferred alignment actually runs along both sides of the river um, and then crosses. At certain moments, it felt just infeasible, unfeasible to have the trail always along the river's edge, especially in areas where there's private land ownership all the way up to the water. And at these moments, um, we're moving the trail to existing roadways and following those roadways um, in the rights of way. So you can see it's really doing it here in this particular segment um, of, of the project and then tying back and connecting back into the river itself. This is Jones Bridge to Island Ford. So you can see here again, um, tying in and connecting, not always going within, sometimes just bringing you to the front door of some of these large park resources and using the existing network of footpaths um, so people can experience some of these uh, national recreation areas that are a little bit more sensitive um, in a more appropriate manner, like on a footpath as opposed to a um, paved trail system. You can see in this slide, some of the uh, other alternative, the more aspirational alternative begins to pop up like in this segment here where our practical alternative moves you away from the water's edge because it's a much more implementable route. Um, there were some concerns here with slopes and adjacencies to the water, but the other alternative shows a potential alignment that one day might be constructed to bring people truly closer to the water's edge. So continuing to move forward, we're beginning to move south closer to the city of Atlanta. You can see the number, the large number of water access points that already exist. Um, some are proposed within the area here. Um, so building on that kind of concept of the blue way as well as uh, the green way, thinking about a multimodal um, experience. This is Gold Branch to Johnson Ferry. The font's getting a little bit messed up there. Um, but you can see some of the network uh, of tributary trails that connect back to population centers but also connect back to Martha Station. So the tributary trails are very important for allowing multiple user groups to um, access the system, uh, even without a car. Um, moving into some of the most like iconic areas of the um, Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area, uh, Cochrane Shoals on the Palisades unit, where you see the steep cliffs and the incredible topography of the Chattahoochee. Here, we're mostly wrapping the west side of the river with the preferred alignment and tying into some of the main entrances of the park spaces. Um, and then moving to Standing Peachtree, getting close to, you know, actually in the uh, city of Atlanta and providing places for um, accessing of the uh, uh, water in this area, providing spaces to portage or uh, launch your boat um, or unlaunch your boat move your boat off the water within this zone um, and connect back up to the trail system. Okay. 
trying to move forward. Here we go. Um, so again, continuing to move south. Uh, this is one of these very important areas. Oops, now it's all catching up with me. I'll try and go back. Oh, wow. <laughs> We've really skipped along, but maybe I'm I'm talking maybe a little bit too long, so I might just I'll stay wherever the slide lands. Um, we were just a moment ago looking at Proctor Creek and that very important extension of the uh, Proctor Creek Greenway to the edge of the Riverlands. Now we're looking further south um, in the Fulton Industrial area, kind of along Fulton Industrial Boulevard, where um, we really have a high concentration of industrial land use along both sides of the river, the city of Atlanta side and the Cobb County side. Um, and you can see here that the one slide north, the trail was on both sides of the river and it's beginning to consolidate um, onto the, the eastern side and then moving to the western side um, to really uh, allow access to this area, which um, is highly privatized today. One of the very interesting things about MRPA is that the legislation has protected this river corridor for that 2000 foot buffer on either side of it, but it's not always enabled public access. So you would never know it driving down Fulton Industrial Boulevard uh, because you see a wall of industry, but the river is behind those buildings and this trail would bring you back to that space. And when you're down by the river, it's even very difficult to tell what's going on uh, up at the industrial edge. So it's almost like another world, it's kind of hidden world um, back here. And that's really what this project is trying to embrace and bring back to the people um, of Metro Atlanta. This is moving south. Uh, we're beginning to transition um, into the uh, agricultural countryside, not quite there, but moving out of that uh, industrial uh, zone. You can see here, it was very important in the southern city area that we have many alternatives on the table. Um, as we move through uh, Old Campbellton and we begin to move into sub area three, uh, there's large, large, large tracks that are privately owned. And so multiple routes and multiple alternatives um, were very important for project planning, uh, being able to implement. So you'll see a lot of those proposed here. Um, at certain moments, we had to kind of delaminate the trail from the river to avoid some of those large private parcels, which might be more aspirational um, trail alignments in the future. So continuing to move south, you know, connecting in the, some of the great resources that exist um, within this area already, trying to connect to uh, different parks, Griffin Hills Park, um, and the uh, boat ramps and kayak launches that exist and are proposed. Um, continuing to move south, Douglas County, uh, you can see crossings uh, across the river, secondary alignments or other alignments, um, and then really using some of the existing roads as the alignment for the trail system, the proposal. Um, one of the very important sites that the trail proposes to link to is the Chattahoochee Hills Riverlands Park, which is a new park that's being proposed along the Riverlands. We have some slides showing the um, with this demonstration site. This would open up a whole new public park resource for the Southern study area of the project. Um, then linking into um, this map is showing Caps Ferry to Moore's Bridge uh, and connecting some of these uh, both historic and uh, park sites. Um, moving through to McIntosh Reserve Park, a park that has very important history uh, within the region and uh, making sure that the trail helps interpret some of that history as well as proposing new crossing points for the bridge, uh, for crossing points over the river to be able to connect these parks which are very close to one another. Um, but if you were trying to get from one to the other today, you have this long circuitous, um, you know, half hour, 45 minute drive around. And so this brings us this kind of connected park network that's really unlocked by the addition of those uh, potential bridge alternatives is shown here uh, in this slide, linking us to um, the southernmost site, the Chattahoochee Bend State Park site, um, which is a very large park, uh, an excellent uh, ecological resource along the river, um, and the proposed uh, greenway uh, runs through it and connects to it and brings you to some of the um, important uh, kind of educational destinations within that project. So hard to describe 100 miles in a short period of time, and I, I definitely left a lot out, um, but we're happy to return to any of those uh, images to kind of speak further on the project. I'll just speak very quickly about a couple of the, the different sites that we focused on in a little bit more detail. 
um, while the majority of the project was very focused on these overall alignment studies for the big 100 mile vision, we also wanted to zoom in and look at a couple of different places. Um, we looked at a pilot site where we used a site uh, in Cobb County to test different material expressions of the trail and to also understand how the trail could be permitted through the MRPA review process in a very um, site specific way. And then we look at three demonstration sites, the Sugar Hill Trailhead, the Proctor Creek Trail Extension, and the Chattahoochee Hills Riverlands Park to describe three different potentially catalytic projects um, that, that embody different principles and different goals of the project. So the pilot site um, is on the Cobb County side, kind of in the center of the study area, um, at the intersection of Nicodac Creek and the Chattahoochee River. So Nicodac Creek here is in the foreground and the Chattahoochee is in the background. There's a small, very interesting little sediment deposit and beach at this location. Um, and so this is really where we tested those uh, MRFA regulations and tried to find existing utility corridors and alignments for the trail that would be the most ecologically sensitive and least disruptive. We began to develop some um, different material sections and you know, dimensioned systems for the trail itself. So what we're looking at here is a a trail that's surrounded by a, an eight inch curb or edge with a six foot pedestrian path, a six inch divider, and an um, eight foot uh, bike path, a two way bike path. And there'd be a textural difference between the two um, zones to uh, kind of enable that wayfinding and safe use of the trail. Um, we also think the trail should have little kind of park like moments, um, even uh, when it's not technically a, a single park site. Um, like the social nook proposed at that uh, Nicodac Creek intersection and Cobb Beach. Um, within a demonstration site, this is uh, further to the north uh, at the kind of northernmost segment of the project at the Sugar Hill Trailhead. Um, this is an excellent opportunity to have a very public facing trailhead that invites people into the project, has a place to park, has a place to linger, has both water access and educational facilities. So the proposal here um, was really to use some of the existing uh, parking resources that exist on the site and kind of create a new vehicular entrance that would bring you down to the water's edge, uh, create an interpretive pavilion, uh, potential nature play space and parking area that would provide a great overlook for the river resources. But make sure that the trail is not too close to the water's edge, that it's in that sensitive ecological habitat. And so you can see the Riverlands Trail traced here in the kind of yellow color. As it moves into the foreground, we're proposing a new bike and pedestrian bridge. Um, that's a much more pleasant experience than the existing uh, vehicular bridge that would also connect to a new boat ramp and kayak storage area stored out of the floodplain. So this is just one of those more immersive views showing that um, perspective from that overlook. So that kind of concept of a window to the river allows people to experience the natural wonder of the Chattahoochee but then the trail pulls away and protects that critical floodplain edge um, and doesn't create a negative impact. You can see some of this braille trail and um, the tactile wayfinding that we learned from the accessibility river ramble um, in the distance here. This next demonstration site is in sub area two, the urban uh, Atlanta portion. Um, it's a very important piece of the project. It's the Proctor Creek Trail extension. Um, the Proctor Creek Trail uh, already has a first phase developed and it ties back to a historically underserved neighborhood and desire of access to the river is incredibly important to that neighborhood. They've already planned the alignment of this tributary trail to come to the water's edge. And what we're suggesting with this demonstration site is what can happen at the intersection of this larger river network shown across the bottom of the image here and the uh, Proctor Creek and the Proctor Creek Greenway kind of looping around or switching back around into the distance, tying population centers that are far from the river directly to the river itself. One of the kind of important concepts within this piece of the demonstration site was a historical interpretive walk um, very close um, to some existing um, uh, interpretive walk that could help interpret the history of the Chattahoochee Brick Company, which is just kind of cropped off the page here. Um, and also create spaces for overlooks, outdoor classrooms, and river uh, access uh, directly along the uh, Chattahoochee River itself. And so uh, one of the just very important things about this whole demonstration project was that 
Uh, this is truly a site that could foster stewardship and hands-on learning, creating a renovating an architectural structure that already exists in the area to be a kind of community hub or community center along Proctor Creek. Um, this is where the, the trail would cross Proctor Creek, um, looking at some of the edge stabilization techniques and outdoor classroom techniques that could be placed here to foster um, education, community education. Um, and then the, the last demonstration site in sub area three um, really, really stem from a need to um, not only improve connectivity in a southern sub area, but to have larger scale park resources open to the public in the agricultural countryside zone. So this is the proposal with Chattahoochee Hills for the Riverlands Park. Um, we created this rendering that began to depict uh, some of the aspiration of this project. I hope it's going to pop up. Let's see. I'm gonna give it a second. Um, but one of the concepts here, there we go, here's the bird's eye view, um, is that uh, we'd be providing very direct access to the water itself uh, with this proposal and project. So creating, again, a boat launch and a water access area um, that directly links people to the water. The Southern sub area just generally has uh, way fewer uh, moments of water access. So today that really uh, limits how people can take a float trip or paddle or you know, canoe or kayak the river. Um, so that's shown here in the foreground, um, but also connect back to a much larger um, park that has uh, many different elements embedded within it, uh, including demonstration sites, event spaces, nature centers, a large network of hiking and walking trails, um, as well as primitive camping uh, along the river itself. And so we see great potential in this, so having a more Kind of programmed water-based edge with this water launch and access point as well as a community center interpretive center and a, a, a kind of vertical beacon or um, kind of viewpoint um, and then this larger expanse of more natural uh, kind of watershed area that will be protected and open for public access and recreation and so with that i have i have flipped to the next slide which i believe shows the rendering it's a little bit stuck behind so that should oh, here we go you can see some of those moments of that direct water access moment along the river. Um, and, and I think you know, the combination of the big picture alignment and these more tangible vision, uh, more tangible demonstration sites, I think really represent the vision and aspiration of this project. Um, it's a long-term effort and your question now is probably, where do we start and how do we do this? And so I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Walt to really talk about um, implementation and next steps. So um, Walt, I think you're up and I, I don't know, uh, maybe Byron or others, you can pass off controls to Walt. Yeah, hi, so this is Walt Ray. Thank you, Gina, for that big um, detailed overview. And it is so much to cover in however many minutes that was, <laughs> 100 miles. Um, but you know what we ended up with, of course, is this big, um, it's, it's a big vision for a, a very flexible framework, right? So we have a framework now that as, as we start to build the riverlands, um, you know, we, we now know that it will all, as we each put our own little pieces, that it will all one day uh, work together. And um, we, we just like to say, this is not a plan. This is, this is an idea because we know that we will have to make amendments as, as conditions evolve and, and as, um, as, Things on the ground change. Um, Byron, I can't forward slides yet. I see someone's mouse moving. It's not mine. Um, so as we start to think about how will this well, get we implemented? Try to do it for you. Okay, next. <laughs> as we start to think about, you know, I how is this all going to be? Yeah, how is this all going to be implemented? We're looking at 125, and you can just hit next. 125 miles of proposed trail and 44 um, tributary trails, which all have mileage of their own. Uh, we have to handle land acquisition, and you can go to next. Um, and connecting parks and, and easements and roadways all into one seamless situation. Um, next. And then we also have, you know, 19 cities and seven metro Atlanta counties and four um, areas that we targeted for. Uh, having issues with, with environmental justice and, and historic disinvestment. 
Uh, we have 1 million people living without, within a 15 minute bike ride of this, of this proposed facility. Next. Um, so we have proposed a very, very big idea. And the big idea, luckily, we're, we're really thrilled has been getting lots of very positive press. And um, we've had lots of uh, sort of region-wide and statewide interest in, in seeing this implemented. Next. Um, but we all know that it's going to take every every partner um, um, pulling in in, in, all, in in tandem to to get this thing off the ground. You know, our our first goal really is to, in terms of implementation, is we really want to establish some positive momentum. And we know that you know there are a lot of um, again we have the seven cities, uh, sorry, the seven counties and the and the 19 cities. We also have a national park with 15 units. We have two state parks and a whole host of agencies and organizations involved in the Chattanooga Working Group. And we can all do our what we can, um, but I can talk to you from TPL's perspective. You know, we're a national organization um, next, and our goal is land for people. We have uh, established ourselves in the Georgia area. Uh, well, there are I think 25 offices nationwide. And how we do this is, you know, we plan. We like we just finished. Um, we are good at fundraising and raising philanthropic dollars. We protect land and uh, we do all this so we, we can actually create parks and green spaces for all people. Next. Um, in the Georgia office, we have been very deeply invested for nearly 30 years in the Chattahoochee River. Um, we have spent those 30 years acquiring 18,000 acres of land to protect it along the river and that accounts for about 80 miles of shoreline. Um, but the Trust for Public Land remains very deeply committed to the Chattahoochee River and its banks and to ensuring that people um, get to enjoy it appropriately, um, and and also we are also very committed to uh, convening the partners and keeping the partners convened so that this can happen. Um, next, I can't speak for all the different organizations, but like I said, there are nearly 80 organizations represented on the Chattahoochee Working Group, and many of them will be able to contribute in their own way. For instance, um, there are some that will be interested in restoring. You know, helping restore the the wildlife habitat and reconnecting the the fragmented um, wild conditions in, in order to serve the birds and the wildlife. Others will be very interested in protecting the water quality. Others will be very interested in helping with the brownfields uh, cleanups and on the, these kinds of things that we need. Um, but for, I can speak for Trust for Public Land. We are very interested in um, championing this the implementation of this project. Um, we see ourselves staying involved. And playing and playing many roles, many different roles depending on the project. If we think of all those miles of trails and all those different um, um, blue way amenities and um, tributary trails, some projects will will need a project lead. Some will have you know um, great interest and be very strategic, but might not have the the jurisdictional capacity that that's needed to get it off the ground and to get it you know funded and built and designed and implemented. Um, so we can, we can, we are, we are prepared to, to identify projects that we should probably serve a role as leadership. Uh, we can, some partners, we might be a fiscal partner from, where there's great, um, great technical support on the ground, uh, very capable partners, they just need some, some help getting over the finish line financially. Sometimes we might need to advocate, um, where there's a, maybe, maybe an issue that's contrary to Riverlands vision, we might need to help communities amplify their voice as, as they help, um, um, challenge some of those obstacles. Sometimes we might need to steer the project from a distance. Sometimes we may need to advise. Sometimes we will just merely um, record and amplify accomplishments by others. But regardless, we'll always be here to administer. And to us, that means you know we have we need to maintain the online platforms such as ChattahoocheeRiverlands.com. Um, we would like to stand up a conservancy, and we are very interested in tracking investments, regardless of what role TPL play. Um, tracking the investments. Uh, for all of the the partners and and the jurisdictions as they as they come online. Next, one example um, of TPL taking a leadership role is that we partner with the National Park Service to build the camp the, to build the beginning of a camp and paddle trail in three different national recreation units. Um, TPL will be leading this um, in partnership, obviously, with with the National Recreation Area um, the, uh, and the National Park Service. We've also partnered with the Georgia River Network, who will be working with us on developing an app, um, a mobile app for the to guide the Paddle Camp Trail, and also with the Atlanta Audubon Society in terms of restoring the native habitat. Um, and if you look at next, 
Um, we're also deeply interested in um, helping as appropriate with the Cobb with the Cobb County pilot project site that Gina spoke about. This is about a 1.7 mile trail proposed between Veterans Memorial um, Parkway and Mableton Parkway on the Cobb County side, really just across from the Charlie Brown Airport. And this is already at 30% construction documents. Um, Cobb County has a strong leadership role in this. We certainly would not attempt to lead the project, but we may serve as a, as a fiscal partnership. The idea being, we're really looking I will say that um, the Trust for Public Land is um, kicking off a feasibility study for our capital campaign that we will explore ways to develop funds so that we can invest as needed in key projects that have the strongest potential to catalyze implementation throughout the 100 miles corridor. And specifically, we're looking for the kinds of projects that establish positive momentum, that get the project started, that are like the Cobb County project site where we have you know, land control, we have willing partners, we have a, um, a lot of public support, and we could really just make some early impacts um, that would help demonstrate the potential of the Riverlands um, to not only to the jurisdictions they're built in, but also to all the other jurisdictions that we're looking at. Um, next, I can't remember, this might be the, the last, the next slide. So, so we're working in, 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 how, in whatever ways we can to establish um, a capital campaign and to help identify which projects we think would be the most um, catalytic and which would establish the most positive momentum moving forward, especially looking for early wins. But we do know that every city, every county, um, every state agency and federal agency involved with the Chattahoochee Riverlands and all the nonprofits are gonna have to carry their weight and pull their own weight. Um, we also know that there's a lot of um, grant level setting with the public you know we've talked to hundreds of people we think thousands of people know about the Chattahoochee river riverlands and its potential but obviously the goal is that everyone in the region should really be wanting this uh, understanding it learning about it and demanding it in their own neighborhoods and towards that end um, the the study is available online you can visit chattahoocheeriverlands.com you can download um, the, the legacy document which is a gorgeous uh, 240 or 260 page document that talks about everything we just talked about today. You could also um, um, download the, the short version. You can pull the maps. You can actually zoom in and, and trace trace the length of the Riverlands and see where it is in your community. And TPL is committed to keeping that um, this website up and active and um, in evolving it so that it serves the Riverlands moving forward as, as, uh, as projects come online. And uh, we look forward to partnering with any organization that would like to, to talk about moving moving a, a section or two or four or five forward in, in a strategic manner. Um, the, the other nice thing though, is that I think tomorrow afternoon, we're anticipating that the Atlanta Regional Commission will, will what, adopt the plan, um, formally adopt it, which I think will make it available, uh, which will qualify um, projects in the Riverland study for federal and state funding, um, specific, specifically for transportation, um, which we see the Riverlands obviously doing quite well. Um, so there are a lot of ways that this will get implemented. It will take a lot of partners and a lot of different people pulling simultaneously. And I think we're all in this together and I think there's a ton of excitement and we hope to capitalize on that and, um, and get things going. Um, I think I'll turn that over to Byron for Q&A. Hey, it's Paul at ARC. I'll, I've been uh, hey, looking over qu uh, questions, and so I have a, there's some, some good ones I came in. Um, there was a few questions involving the uh, trails. Are the, um, Will the, the trails be all paved to, to accommodate bikes and wheelchairs, or will they be a mix of a paved and, and unpaved? And what does the whole project do for uh, people with uh, disabilities in general? That's actually a really great question. I will say the study that we just completed does not specify trail materials. Uh, we were actually deliberately trying not to specify trail materials. Um, but we know with the existing conditions on the ground, we know that with different owners, and different um, jurisdictions and like the National Park Service and, and possibly the state parks and different cities. They all have a different idea of what they think is appropriate for their land. 
And the goal is really the next step, a big next step, is to really work with all the 19 cities, seven counties, and all the agencies to develop um, collaboratively a set of design guidelines. The goal would be to give this uh, the users a very consistent experience, regardless of what um, jurisdiction they're in, or what city, what county, what park they're in. Uh, it should feel the Riverlands Trail should feel like the Riverlands Trail, regardless of where you are. We don't know exactly what that looks like, but I can I can pretty much guarantee that it's going to be a, a collection of different surfaces and different materials and different widths um, to accommodate users. I will just say that I am prepared to. Um, I think we should use this as a commuter trail. I think you should be able to ride your bike to work on it. And I've ridden my bike to work in the rain on a gravel trail, and it was not fun. Um, however, teach his own, and we will we will work through that as a region. All right, great. Gina, do you want to add anything? You have a yeah, I think the, the only thing I would add, I think Walt, you described it really well, um, that the the hundred mile long site is so diverse that no one, you know, cross section can be applied in every area. That would really not do the complexity and the, the unique, um, you know, site aspect that you encounter along the trail any justice whatsoever. And one of one of the techniques we've been thinking about is. Um, you know, if you are a bicyclist and you want to be biking on a harder surface, in some of the alignment studies that I showed, the main piece of Riverlands Trail connects to the beginning of some of these more sensitive national park resources and then relies upon the network of existing uh, more ecologically sensitive trails that already exist within those recreation areas uh, to serve the need to get to the water's edge. And so I, I would feel pretty good about saying there is this desire to make sure there is a functional bikeable path that probably has a harder material stitching up and down the entire corridor um, in some configuration. However, that doesn't mean it's always along the river's edge and we definitely don't wanna be placing harder materials where we have these very ecologically sensitive zones. So that that is really why we need this next phase of the trail standards and uh, to really be able to develop, you know, probably a catalog of five, 10, 15 different typical sites that are encountered and develop standards for each of those particular circumstances. Yeah, great, great. question though. One where we'll be chewing on for a long time. Yeah, can someone address the uh, uh, creation of the uh, trails? Is it, there's a, a different alternatives were offered Will you implement a preferred trail, but then switch to a practical one where, where needed? Is it, is it a mix and match? I can speak to that, Walt, and maybe then you can pick it up. Um, you know, I think the preferred alternative is the alternative that had, I think, the most stakeholder buy-in in all of our different work sessions and felt implementable. So I think in almost all cases, we're probably, you know, in the next five years with all the different municipalities and towns along the Riverlands, beginning to implement projects, we'll probably be looking at the preferred alternative as the priority path of, of planning and design. Um, however, there's always roadblocks, right? You never know what will happen in the future. Um, not all conditions have been anticipated. You can't anticipate everything that's gonna come up in a hundred mile long project. Um, and so the, the practical alternative is there, uh, just so we're fully assessing the kind of backup alternative. And the uh, other alternative is also there in case, you know, someone gets a grant and has a, a more than anticipated amount of money to build a trail in an area that might be more expensive or uh, might involve a longer route but connects more areas. And so the preferred alternative is kind of meeting the conditions that we have today. That's both aspirational but practical. But, you know, as we, as we can see from um, just the past six months, conditions around us are constantly changing and the plan is meant to be very flexible and adaptable to future challenges and opportunities. Yeah, perfect. Um, who is going to be responsible for maintaining a trail and other infrastructure and how to, how to pay for it? Is this going to be handled by the, the a local government up and down the uh, a corridor? Well, I mean, as we all know, there are what seven counties and, and 19 cities and um, state parks and national parks, and so there are there are a host of, of people claiming jurisdiction. Um, I think I think we all see the need for some sort of overarching conservancy or some sort of overarching organization that can help provide a very consistent user experience throughout all those different jurisdictions, regardless of the capacity or capabilities. Um, 
you know, the Silver Comic Trail is similar. It goes through, I don't know how many counties, several counties and different cities. And it feels very consistent. I, I know that different counties and different cities do do their own maintenance. Um, but I think with the Riverlands, I, we, we anticipate that there will be, uh, each jurisdiction may be responsible for its own maintenance and management, but that I think we should trust the public land is willing to stand up a conservancy to help backfill where needed um, so that all users, regardless of where you are, have a, have a very all the time. Great. Uh, can you uh, uh, touch on what the vision is for how people will access th the this a uh, trail? Is it going to be a car, bus, walking, biking, or is that up to the local uh, jurisdictions, or is there a unified vision? You know, I think that's going to evolve, right? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, we we were very deliberate in in tying where we could the Riverlands Trail, you know, alignment into um, existing, you know, um, transit access. Um, I have a big vision where like people will just leave their back doors or their front doors, right, and walk to or bicycle to the river and they'll use it on a daily. I mean, like the Beltline, people walk to the Beltline from their homes all the time, but people also drive to it. They take public transportation to it. Um, I think what we propose is a very big framework with, is it 25 trailheads? I forget how many trailheads. I'm hoping that that will be many, many, many more that they're going to sort of pop up organically as demand necessitates. Um, and so what we propose is a flexible framework, but we think that it will definitely be much, much, much more granular once we look at, at the local scale more, more closely. Yeah, and I think like, you know, there's just such a big diverse um, area to be considering. There's no one way. So at the Sugar Hill Trailhead, that might be um the place that you know people want to bike the entire trail and have a really adventurous moment that's maybe where you would start um however you know as a neighbor you might like walk out of your backyard and walk down the proctor creek greenway to get to the trail and have this full pedestrian network bring you to the edge uh versus some of the tributary trails that feed into like larger regional transportation hubs like market stations or bus stops um, mm -hmm. And then there's also spaces like the Chattahoochee Bend State Park, um, where there isn't as much public transportation infrastructure in the area um, that we understand, you know, is a, a driving but also a biking destination um, that has uh, significant parking and can accommodate people from all over that might just come to use the park that day and then discover the trail as part of their experience. Finally, there's amazing spots like along Fulton Industrial Boulevard where um, you know, someone who is working in one of the industrial facilities might take their lunch break and hop down to the trail edge to just eat a sandwich along the river um, and only, you know, not use it as a linear space, but use it as a in, you know, frequent destination. And so it has the potential to be used in all of these different diverse ways. There's, there's no one right way of using the proposed system. Great, thank you. Um, one more uh, question uh, regarding, uh, this is probably for Gina. Can uh, you talk about how you were able to get uh, the, the public input that was a truly representative of our uh, community? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the process for public input is still evolving, right? This project is really at this kind of big picture vision phase and moving forward. Um, it will incorporate further rounds of public involvement and discussion. Um, I would say right now the best way to kind of get involved and uh, have your voice heard is through participation on the Chattahoochee Riverlands website, uh, which is here on the screen, ChattahoocheeRiverlands.com. Um, on that, we have uh, a lot of different features of the methods of public participation um, shown um, within uh, some of the web website resources. So you can see our public uh, stakeholder engagement plan, which is posted there. You can also see some of the results from the, the big like public working sessions that we had like at Creek and at other um, kind of community destinations along the river. Um, we also just made sure that we were always meeting, um, kind of having repeat meetings with different community groups and stakeholders uh, regularly throughout the project process so that we could really show how the project had evolved in direct response to their feedback. And so the sub area committee meetings that we had um, at multiple points throughout the process to help develop the vision, to help develop the project goals, to help 
uh, develop the early alignments, to help develop the preferred alignment, and then to help finalize the demonstration sites and the proposals there. Um, we developed just a great rapport and kind of working method uh, with these different stakeholder groups, always returning uh, with, with um, the plan that was updated based upon the things that we had heard in the last meetings. And so, um, you know, it, it was a very robust public engagement process. And I think some of the, the stat slides that Walt showed uh, incorporated some of it, but there were literally hundreds of meetings held along the river. Um, but I will say it was just like one tiny piece of a project that's been conceptualized for many years and a project that will be in development for many years to come. So hundreds of meetings are probably just, you know, the first set of hundreds of many hundreds to come. Right. Remember, Paul, that, you know, so we have proposed 100 miles or 125 miles of trail, but I think it's each and every little he wants to build the trail from this road to that road. That's a whole new design process that will kick off a whole new set series of public engagement and refinements and you know how to conquer challenges and, and, and understanding what the public's interests are at a more you know finite local hyper local level. Right. But we're not done with the public engagement. We just sort of set up a framework to keep start it really. Well, thanks everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. I hope everybody I found this informative and inspiring. Uh, and this will not be the last that you hear about the Chattahoochee Riverlands. Thanks so Thank much. you for having us, Paul. Bye. Thank you, everyone. And that will conclude today's webinar. Um, our next webinar will be on September 15th. Um, we're taking a break for a couple weeks. So please uh, join us then. It will be on our regional economy and the impacts of the COVID. So thank you and have a great afternoon. and. Take care.